I have to talk to you today about uh, Mises and Rothbard on ethics and the differences between them. Uh, ethics is, uh, of course, there, uh, there are some people who don't take ethics very seriously. Uh, <coughs> I'm reminded uh, Bertrand Russell once said that uh, the Ten Commandments should be approached uh, like a final exam at Cambridge. Only eight out of ten need be attempted at one at one at one time. Uh, now, there's another story about ethics in. Uh, in one of the P.G. Woodhouse novels, uh, they, they, all, they generally, you, if you're familiar with the story, the, uh, uh, the hero of many of them named Bertie Wooster and his, and his, uh, uh, his, uh, col his colleague always visit the drones club but once they go to a, a different club and there's a character there who says whenever anything comes up i always ask myself one question uh, what's in it for me mm. and of course in, in this group i'm not sure that uh, people would see anything wrong with that. And that's, but now I want to uh, start with uh, is a ver uh, what I think is the fundamental point that uh, on which Rothbard and Mises differ. And that is the question is ethics objectively true. Now, what, what, in, what do we mean by that? Uh, well, there are certain things that are just true in a robust sense. For example, if I say there are fewer than 200 people in this room that is true. It's just a simple matter of fact. It's not dependent on anyone's opinion whether this is true or not. It's just straightforwardly true. Uh, the question then is, is ethics true? in this, or objective in this sense, just as we could say uh, it's an objective matter of fact that there are fewer than 200 people in this room, is it objectively the case that, say, uh, pain is other things being equal bad? Is that something that's true regardless of what people happen to think? Is it straightforwardly true? Uh, uh, one, uh, one clarification I should give in, uh, in this matter is people will say, uh, when I say it isn't up to uh, people's, uh, uh, it isn't up to people's opinion whether, say, pain is bad, other things being equal is true. Some people might object, uh, look, isn't ethics doesn't it have to be about human welfare? Isn't, so 
how could it be the case that uh, it isn't dependent on what human beings think if it's about, it has to be about human welfare. Uh, but this is, as I'm sure uh, you can see, at least I hope, you can see this is a confusion because what we're talking about here is, when we say, is ethics objectively true? Is what's uh, not what's in the, 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 what, this, what we're talking about, not what things are included in the content of ethics, but what whether people's opinions about those things are, uh, up, are are just dependent on their own on their own views it, that it isn't a matter of choice. Say, if ethics is about human welfare, then it's on the uh, this objective view. It's true that ethics is about human welfare and should be, they're, they're in fact people who say, say they're people who don't agree with that. Say the 19th century German philosopher Edward von Hartmann thought it would be a good idea if human beings uh, became extinct. He thought human beings were bad and they should pass out of existence. And there are people today who think that many environmentalists think human beings should be gotten rid of or uh, they, they, some of them are, make efforts to bring this about actually. So if on the view that moral judgments are objectively true, then those people are wrong. It isn't just a matter of opinion. Now, uh, Mises and Rothbard uh, took were the different positions on this issue. Mises was a subjectivist. He thought that if we're talking about value judgments or statements of what's good or bad, then in his view, it doesn't make sense to say that there's some objective truth in the matter. We could say if someone holds that uh, something is, uh, if someone holds that something is, is good or bad, and the person, uh, you could ask the person, uh, why do you think that's good or bad? And you would eventually come to some judgment, some statement by the person, hey, that's just what I want. That would be an ultimate value judgment. And if the person said that, you really couldn't say anything against that person. You could say, uh, you don't hold this view, but as long as the person said that was what uh, he ultimately wanted, that would be it. It's just a matter of preference. Now, uh, this is this view that uh, he cannot, that uh, ethical judgments are just a matter of preference 
is one that's very popular among economists, that some economists uh, wouldn't, they, they just don't uh, think there's any sense in saying, well, there is, someone has a value judgment, could we raise the question, is this person right or wrong in, in having that value judgment? We could, uh, the economists could point out consequences for the person if the person acts on the value judgment. We couldn't say the value judgment as such is either right or wrong. It, it just according to them, it wouldn't make sense. It's just It's just a matter of opinion. Uh, when uh, people, sometimes people will uh, call this view relativism. Also, they'll say uh, ethical judgments are relative. I prefer to use relativism for a different position, which would be the view that there are truths about ethics, it's, it's, but these are relative to particular groups or classes or races or whatever else it's claimed that the truth is relative to. So on the way I'm characterizing relativism, somebody, uh, somebody could, it, it would be true say that you ought to do certain things if you're a member of a particular group. The truth isn't relative to, I mean, it, it isn't up to you to decide what you want to do, it's depending on the group that just tells you what you ought to do. Now, uh, this, uh, this point about relativism has led me, uh, has once uh, gotten, got me into a very embarrassing position because if there's some, there's one thing I find more upsetting than people not laughing at my jokes is that they laugh at comments I make that I don't intend as jokes. <laughs> that's really, that's really awful. And on one, I, I remember on this one occasion, I said, there, there are certain sorts of uh, statements that uh, are self-refuting. For example, if I say it's absolutely true that all, st that all statements are just true from a particular point of view, then it would seem like my, that statement is just true from a particular point of view. But I've said it's absolutely true, so I'm contradicting myself. So what I said that occasioned much laughter was I said, suppose someone says that uh, all ethical judgments are relative, meaning by that uh, not relative in this way I'm, I just distinguished, but just meaning relative as just a matter of opinion. So the person would be saying all ethical statements are relative. So I said uh, that statement itself, all ethical statements are relative isn't and it, it could isn't self-refuting it could be absolutely true that all ethical statements are relative 
and that produced uproarious laughter. But I, I see, I see. This is a, a smarter audience, so you realize the if you say all ethical judgments or statements are relative, then that isn't an ethical statement itself. It's a statement about ethical statements. So it's immune. So I'm glad you I'm glad you didn't laugh. I'll try to come up later with some actual jokes. <laughs> I, I do know I do know a few, but with me the problem in uh, giving jokes in lectures is not coming up with jokes, but it's in suppressing jokes that I shouldn't be I shouldn't be giving. But now to return to uh, let's consider Mises' position. So Mises says that. Uh, there aren't objectively uh, true ethical judgments. It's just a matter of preference. If you have an ultimate value judgment, that's it. However, he says we can have hypothetical statements like such as if you want such and such then this is a way, the best way to achieve that. Say, if you want to, uh, if you want to stop listening to a boring lecture, you should immediately exit this room. So that would that would be an example of a hypothetical statement, and. Uh, so, so we could have these true hypotheticals. So we have, we can't question the ultimate value judgment, but we could question, we could have judgments of what people ought to do. I mean, we could have judgment of what people ought to do, given that they have a certain uh, ultimate judgment. And he thought, in fact, most people do have a, the ultimate judgment that they want peace and prosperity. So he said, uh, we can say that people ought to, in the, the way to attain that is to have social cooperation through the free market. So he thought, although we can't say that you must have this preference for uh, uh, peace and prosperity, he thought, in fact, people would say that, most people would say that, and he could tell them how to achieve that. So he, that, that's his, uh, his idea of how, of how you could get, you would come up with what seems like a uh, uh, he comes up with a defense of the free market, and but it's not based on an appeal to objective ethics. It's just uh, given that most people want this goal, this is what we should uh, aim for. Now. Uh, the question I'm going to raise now is, uh, what did, why did Mises reject the view that there's an objective ethics? Uh, one, he, he doesn't really have an enormous amount to say about that. 
uh, one thing he does, he, he seems to, he says, one thing is that we can't, he says, we can't, if someone says, uh, I hold different values from the ones you do, he thinks, aside from raising questions about showing consequences of what uh, holding those views will lead to, that you can't really argue with the person. You could just say, uh, here's what I believe, and here's what the other person would say, here's what I believe, and there'd be no there'd be no uh, way of settling the, the question. Uh, he was familiar with their, their various attempts by philosophers to argue in favor of objective ethics, for example, the natural law philosophies of uh, familiar in uh, from St. Thomas Aquinas and from Aristotle and their attempts by Kantian philosophers to argue for ethical objectivity. Mises was, of course, familiar with those, but he didn't, he didn't really take them very seriously. I can't say that he uh, really considered them at great length. He just didn't, he didn't. For him, they just seem like obviously wrong. Uh, now we could see as an example of uh, one, one way in which uh, this difference would come out uh, just between objective and uh, subjective views of ethics. Uh, suppose someone goes to a doctor for physical examination. It's usually a mistake. I can tell you from someone my age, avoid doctors at all costs. <laughs> but if you, suppose a person goes to a doctor and uh, a doctor says to him, uh, if you continue smoking, it's uh, very likely that you'll get lung cancer. So uh, we would the diff uh, if you held an objective theory, you would say you, the doctor has given the patient a good reason to stop smoking namely that lung cancer is objectively bad for the person. It isn't a matter of opinion whether cancer is good or bad. It's just bad for the person. So uh, the other view, which would be the Misesian view, the subjectivist view, would be you'd have to add the further premise, the patient would have to say, I don't want cancer. So if the, if the patient, you need this extra step so the person could say, well, it's going to give me cancer, uh, so what? I don't care about that. So on that view, the person wouldn't have a good reason to give up cancer. Now, of course, uh, very few people would take that uh, view and say, so what? Uh, I don't care if I have get cancer or not. But in fact, Mises used that point to, uh, in defense of his own style of ethics, he thought that most people would want the same, the same sorts of, of things 
uh, as I mentioned, most people want peace and prosperity. So similarly, you gave the case, say, a doctor, we could imagine an economist adopt or the, someone adopting the point of view of a doctor uh, 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 adopting the point of view of the patient, say, uh, assuming you want to get better, you, you, you want to avoid getting cancer, you should do such and such. So Mises would say there's some ethical judgments that are obviously held by people. So even if we don't call them objective, they're ones that people will hold. Uh, now, Murray Rothbard uh, uh, thought there were problems with that view. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, there are some people who don't, who think, uh, say if you say most people want social cooperation through the free market, uh, what if some, some people didn't, that Mises wouldn't be able to say those people are wrong. He could say the other people, those of us who do, should try to uh, uh, st stop those people and make sure they don't prevail. But they couldn't say that uh, they're objectively wrong. And further, it, depend, it depended on Mises acknowledges, it depended on the view Mises held that social cooperation through the market is in the long run interests of everyone. But what if people had the view, I should just, I don't care about the long run, like, uh, Lord Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So I'm just going to do what I want to do now. Forget about the long run. That Mises would have no way of saying those people are mistaken. So uh, uh, further, suppose someone said, all right, social cooperation through the market is a great idea. I'm in favor of that, but I want to, I want to take advantage of other people just in this particular instance. What if a person did that? Then, according to Rothbard, Mises wouldn't have a good argument against them, he would, uh, now, so that is uh, what Mises, that is the way Mises viewed ethics. And in the time remaining, I want to say something about uh, Rothbard's views. And Rothbard, I, I should say, in this talk, I'm just giving an exposition of the two thinkers. I'm not trying to uh, defend one or the other, but I'm in much more inclined to a Rothbardian view than a Misesian one on this. Uh, you can take that, my being in favor of that, as a reason uh, either for or against the Rothbardian view, depending on what you think of whether what I, my ideas are likely to be true or not. Uh, that, that was supposed to be a joke, you, you, you know. I mean, they, they, the jokes don't get any better. You, you have to laugh now. I'm sorry. Uh, so. 
Uh, in Rothbard's view, which is based on uh, uh, Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, we can, th uh, th just by thinking about human nature, we could uh, we could come up with what the requirements are for living a good, uh, a flourishing life. What do people need to flourish? And we could draw up a list of what uh, qualities are required. And this, again, is based on Aristotle and Aquinas, but with one crucial difference, as I'll bring out. So we could say uh, human beings need to, where human beings are rational animals, so we need to develop and use our reason. We need friendship. Uh, we need uh, to engage in activities we find enjoyable. So we could draw up a list of what people, uh, what people need for a flourishing life. We could draw up the constituents. We could draw up a list of the constituents of such a, uh, of what human beings need. And based on this list, we could say uh, this is how people should live their lives. So it isn't up to you to decide whether you want to live your life that way in the sense that if you choose not to, then uh, it's, uh, that's just, you made your choice. Uh, Rothbard would say, if you don't live that way, you're not living in accord with man's essence. So you're, you're wrong, you're, you're mistaken. This is the, this is the list that you you must follow. Uh, the great uh, legal philosopher uh, John Finnis, who taught at Oxford for many years, has a very good book on natural law, where he goes into this notion of a list of human goods. So that would be one to study if you're interested in further, uh, further pursuit of that. So Rothbard says, from human nature, this is what you ought to do. Uh, the, uh, some, you, you might be inclined to say, does, for some of you, uh, say are, as many of you may be are religious, so you might ask, does, is Rothbard ruling out religious ethics, say Christian ethics, or people say we ought to do such and such because God commands us to do that? And I would say no, uh, he's not ruling that out, but he's following Aquinas in, think, in saying that natural law is something that can be figured out by reason. So the, if you had com uh, divine commandments, they would be additions to this or modifications of it, but they wouldn't be changing the nature, the nature of that. Now, I want to deal now with an objection that uh, 
might have occurred to many of you. Uh, suppose we say on this, as uh, I mentioned on, on this rule, that uh, because human beings have a certain nature, uh, this is what they ought to do. This is the life that they will find flourishing. So the objection is, uh, well, if you say that, aren't you deriving an ought from an is? And you can't do that. Uh, David Hume is supposed to have shown you can't do that if, if uh, given all the factual judgments, uh, nothing logically follows about what you ought to do. So isn't Rothbard wrong in trying to derive an ought from an is? Uh, now, the... Uh, there are two ways to answer that. I mean, one would be just to say, well, on Rothbard's view, uh, ought, he, he is defining an ought as, uh, for a human being, as what fulfills their human nature. So uh, since he's defined ought in that way, he's not deriving He's not wrongly deriving an ought from an is. He's just, from the way he's characterized it, you can derive an ought from an is. I say that that's probably the one answer. But the easy answer is, OK, except that you can't derive an ought from an is, but you just add the premise, uh, people ought to act according to the requirements of human nature. So then you get the principle Rothbard once. Now, give, uh, I mentioned there's a crucial point at which uh, Rothbard differs from Aristotle and Aquinas. And the point that he differs is that they uh, they say, and he rather agrees with them, that human beings need to live in society. They need to. Uh, it, as Aristotle famously says, a human being living apart from society would be either a beast or a god. Human beings need to live together. But Aquinas and Aristotle think that there has, that there has to be a state which is a political entity which is directing people to the common good. Uh, they didn't uh, at that time really have the notion of a spontaneous order where people can just get together and form a society without a state. So they thought that uh, human beings, that there has to be a central body directing uh, People and uh, Rothbard thought this was a fundamental failing in uh, natural law theory as developed by uh, Aristotle and Aquinas. And he thought that John Locke, in uh, in his view, in talking about civil society developing without a state was, uh, had made it uh, better and added to uh, natural law. So you could have 
uh, then you would have civil, uh, you would have the institutions of society would be developed without a state. And he thought that he criticized at various points in his writings there were uh, Catholics, philosophers, the Catholic natural law theorist Heinrich Rahman, who would be very prominent in Germany and then went under, into exile under the Nazis, had written on natural law and he thought Rahman was one who had made this mistake. And also the French philosopher Yves, Yves Simon was another one who had made this mistake. So Rothbard thought that uh, people don't need a, uh, a civil society, a state to direct them what to do. And given that human beings don't need a state, uh, the question would then be what uh, what rights, if any, do people have? And Rothbard thought that there were two really basic rights that were followed from his conception of natural law, where that people are self-owners and they have the right to acquire property and pass this on and exchange it uh, with others. And I should say uh, the Rothbardian framework has been developed by two philosophers, uh, Doug uh, Rasmussen and Doug Denial, who have had a series of books defending what is, I think, essentially a Rothbardian view of natural rights, natural law of a kind, I've tried to explain. And you can find this in uh, their books, The uh, Perfectionist Turn and The Realist Turn. And I think they show uh, in a quite plausible way how uh, one could develop a, Roth, a view of natural law quite congenial with Rothbard. So I think it would be, since I, it would also be quite congenial if I ended my lecture on time, so I'm going to do that. Thank you. <laughs>